series, new web lecture series, and on mechanical ventilation. I think this is third in the uh, series that uh, we are having uh, the talks on neonatal ventilation. And uh, today, uh, I have my dear friend, Dr. Venkat Session, who is an additional professor at neonatal unit at Department of Pediatrics, Chandigarh who's going to tell us about high frequency ventilation, basically uh, the mechanics and strategy. I, I know many of us are using uh, high frequency ventilation, but still there is a lot to learn when it comes to HFO regarding how does it work? When should we start? What are those common strategies that we are going to adapt? So I think to cover this important aspects of high frequency ventilation, uh, I think we have Dr. Venkat, and he had uh, the reason why we chose him is because we during our ventilation workshop, I think he had spoken on the same topic and it was well appreciated by all the postgraduates in the ventilation workshop. So I thought it was a good idea to ask him to share again his uh, presentation on uh, this important topic. Uh, Venkat, uh, over to you and uh, thanks for accepting our invitation and uh, agreeing to give this talk. Um, thank you and uh, it's over to you, Dr. Venkat. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pradeep, and uh, I should thank Abhishek and OM Hospital for giving me a chance to you know, share my experience and knowledge, whatever I gained in HFO. Uh, am I audible? No, oh, you're audible. Audible, okay, fine. Uh, so without wasting time, actually, I'll spend around 30, 35 minutes, 40 minutes on the HFO mechanics and strategies. So the learning objectives are going to be like this. I'll cover the definition as well as indications of HFE. Uh, when I say HFE, then I'm going to talk more about high frequency oscillation than the jet ventilation because we, uh, at least in our country, the experience is more with oscillatory ventilation than uh, jet and flow interrupters. So I'll discuss the mechanisms of um, high frequency ventilation in comparison to the conventional ventilation. Um, little bit types of high frequency ventilation equipment that provide high frequency ventilation I'll cover. So I'll discuss more about the strategies, how to initiate uh, HFE, how to titrate and maintain the HFE and how to exit. What is the point when we should uh, stop HFE and move to other modes of ventilation? Um, we don't have a lot of evidence on HFO. Uh, what are the evidence there? It's very old, maybe 10, 15 years old. So I'll touch briefly upon the evidence for HFO in various disease processes. So uh, before getting into HFE, certain basic concepts. So we should know what is the frequency means because we use our high frequency. The frequency means number of events in a given time. And the event of intersection here is breaths. So it will be breaths per minute, BPM. Another way of exp expressing the, you know, the BPM actually is in Hertz. Um, the abbreviation is HZ. So one Hertz actually is equivalent to 60 events or 60 breaths per minute. That's a, that's a formula to remember actually in this. In a conventional ventilation, uh, mechanical ventilation, normally we give rates of 20 to 60 breaths per minute, which will be equivalent to 0.33 to 1 hertz, if you convert that into hertz. In, uh, in HF, in high frequency ventilation, it will be from anywhere from 3 to 20 hertz, which is equivalent to 190 to 1200 breaths, breaths per minute. Quite actually a big number. So if you use a conventional ventilation, ventilatory ventilation, and try to give actually high breath rate so there lead to more complication. We need to actually understand how the HFE really helps to um, ventilate a newborn. So we should also know that actually how the lung volumes are important. For example, a lung volume and a term neonate. So you can see here. What is the point? Okay, so this one actually shows the lung volumes in a neonate and how it actually compares to an adult lung volume. So the purple uh, bar is a, the tidal volume. So a normal term newborn, tidal volume is anywhere 5 to 8 ml per kg. But what is more important is the dead space volume. So here actually is the anatomical dead space volume. So the anatomical dead space volume actually is anywhere from 2 to 2.5 ml per kilogram. Why it is important actually is in high frequency ventilation, the tidal volume, whether it's called as an oscillating volume or oscillatory volume, generally very low. So as low that it's actually less than dead space volume also, so less than 2 ml per kilo. But the common question actually is that if it's such a low volume, how the volume, how the gas actually would reach the end actually, like would reach the uh, alveolar it becomes a question. So there's many mechanisms how actually really the gas exchange and the gas uh, movement takes place. We can discuss it a little later. But the important part actually is 
So the tidal volume or the oscillating volume actually is very low, less than 2 ml per kilo. Uh, there are certain key characteristics of key characteristics of uh, So there are certain key characteristics actually of the of the HFE. So first is high frequency. So we know it around uh, I said three to fifteen hertz, but generally six to fifteen hertz per minute. Second is a very small tidal volume. As I told, actually it's less than or equal to anatomical dead space, so less than two ml per kilo. The third is very important to call actually a HFE as a true high frequency ventilation. You need to have an active inspiration and more important an active expiration also. That is very important. So I'll tell what exactly it means. The fourth component is oxygenation and ventilation pretty much uncoupled. What does it mean? In a conventional ventilation, when you modify a parameter which modifies oxygenation, it would have the impact on the ventilation also invariably. But in high frequency oscillatory ventilation, generally the oxygenation and ventilation parameters, you can modify them independently and they are actually largely uncoupled. Which means that if you modify one parameter which modifies oxygenation, it doesn't generally affect the ventilation much. That's a very important point. So the fifth important point is ventilation means removing carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide removal, we know that in a conventional ventilation proportional to the frequency and tidal volume. It means that higher the frequency, higher CO2 removal. Higher the tidal volume, higher CO2 removal. But here, the CO2 removal actually depends on the square of tidal volume because the normal tidal volume is very small in this. The formula which applies more is frequency multiplied by tidal volume squared. Why it is important? Any change in tidal volume is going to lead to an enormous change in the CO2 also. Tidal volume goes up, the CO2 is going to actually get removed actually faster and more significantly than it happens in the conventional ventilation also. Last important point is largely, largely that in higher frequencies, the ventilation is lung compliance independent. Which means that if you are actually handling with a premature newborn who has high lung brain disease and a low lung compliance versus a term newborn and you are handling with a Mekon aspiration syndrome, which actually has a variable lung compliance. So, largely, actually, HFV is lung compliance independent. It means that compliance keeps changing up and down, but the ventilation, oxygenation, and carbon dioxide removal actually would not get affected much because of lung compliance, especially so if there is actually higher frequencies. 10 hertz frequency and beyond 10 hertz, the premature they want typically. So the lung compliance would not really actually modify or affect the ventilation. That is the important part to understand. So now let me move to the next slide. So, so uh, to aptly describe this high frequency is supraphysiologic, not a physiologic rate more like in panting. You look at the animals, no, dogs especially. So they pant at a very high rate. So that's supra physiologic for a neonate, for a human infant. And the small tidal volume is infra physiologic. So how the supra physiologic rates and infra physiologic volume would really work? To understand, you should understand the principal differences in the common modes of ventilation. Um, you look at actually first the common mode of ventilation actually here. So the first actually one shows you actually how uh, ventilation conventionally, how does it work? You can see the float one end and patient in the middle and the P, double P is a valve, you can find that exhaust here. So this one is a bias flow the gas gets inside. So I will use a pointer for a moment actually. So that one end, the gas flow gets inside, the gas keeps flowing in the tube. So you have a valve at the other end the valve, if it is completely open, the gas is going to get inside and get out from this end. The patient would not get any gas pressure at the middle of the tube inside. So this valve, if it is partly closed, so the partly closed one actually is going to give the PWP or a closed, remain closed all the time, is going to give the positive end expiratory pressure. And if the same valve is going to actually close and open repeatedly, it's going to give the PAP, so the peak inspiratory pressure. That's how normally a conventional ventilation works. In a high frequency ventilation, we have introduced actually a, an oscillating piston or a diaphragm in the middle. 
the flow is still happening called as a bias flow or the bulk flow the end actually is going to give actually the pwp you want to call as the paw in this case paw you can find a small line here it's an average pressure or it's called mean airway pressure or pressure in the airway so the same valve is there the valve is close to the higher pressure now it is going to be the mean airway pressure here and you have a piston or a diaphragm or a piston pushing a diaphragm that is going to oscillate repeatedly so it moves the diaphragm into the into the towards circuit actually here and as it moves towards it is going to push the gas into the patient and as it moves away it is going to pull out the gas inside so when it moves towards it is going to actually become an active inspiration when it moves away it is going to be active expiration that's an oscillator is going to give an active inspiration and active expiration repeatedly so interesting part you don't need an extra flow the same bias flow probably at a higher rate higher flow rate so it's going to move towards the towards the circuit inside so the airway pressure now the valve is closed more leads to a higher mean airway pressure and the piston is going to operate at one end and trying to push the gas inside repeatedly there are two more ways actually of giving high frequency so one is called high frequency flow interrupters and another is called high frequency jet ventilators in both the condition you need to have an additional circuit this circuit gives separate flow apart from the bias flow and that flow is have is going to allow the gas to flow from this side towards the patient circuit you can have a diaphragm that is going to interrupt the flow repeatedly and by interrupting it is going to vary the pressure inside so that's called high frequency flow interrupter or you may actually have the end of the circuit is tapered as a jet nozzle so that is going to increase the velocity of the of the gas getting inside that is going to modify the velocity of the gas in the main circuit inside and modify the pressure repeatedly that's how the high frequency jet ventilator works but in both the conditions in a flow interrupter and jet ventilator you need to have a separate flow and a separate circuit add on to the main circuit otherwise the pwp the valve the exhaust all the principle remains same in all the modes of ventilation so the key difference is in an oscillator you have an oscillating piston or a diaphragm or a combination and you don't have separate circuit in a flow interrupter or a jet ventilator you have an additional circuit which is servo controlled again is going to actually interrupt or jet the gas in the main circuit inside so this table compares the hfe with conventional ventilation so we know that the frequency is high in hf ov as well as in hf jv so what is important actually is that the exhalation part the exhalation part is passive in the in a conventional ventilation as well as in jet ventilation but it's an active exhalation in oscillatory ventilation in an oscillatory ventilation a conventional ventilation add on is not required but is required in jet ventilation to maintain the bias flow that's very important and as i told you the oxygenation and ventilation is uncoupled in an oscillatory ventilator it means that you can control them independently but in a jet ventilation it is partly uncoupled not as, not as uncoupled as an oscillatory ventilation now look at the graph below is very important so the left one is an illustration showing an high frequency oscillatory ventilation so this one is the time axis and this one actually is the pressure axis so you can see the waveform is sinusoidal but it can be squared waveform also or mixed waveform also depending on the ventilator depending on the settings and strategy you are using but in this example this one is a typical sinusoid waveform you can see from the baseline to peak of the sinus wave this is the amplitude otherwise is called power of a piston use a piston or diaphragm it has certain power with what it can push the gas inside so that is called as amplitude so and starting of the cycle and end of cycle is called the frequency measured in hertz now the amplitude and the frequency two important determinants which modifies tidal volume or oscillatory volume to improve the oscillatory volume what i should do i can do certain things i'll take a pen and i'll show you hold on for a moment yeah so like imagine the same the, there is a higher lower frequency i am going to draw another wave here so now there will be a larger sinus wave positive and larger wave negative so what will happen is eventually this tidal volume or the volume that has been actually actively moved in 
and moved out during inspiration is going to be higher when there is a lower frequency. It means a lower frequency, I have longer time for the waveform to complete. So I have actually a larger inspiratory cycle and larger expiratory cycle. Both the sinusoid becomes larger. So I am going to push more volume of gas inside and pull out more volume of gas outside. That leads to better oxygenation as a better ventilation also, which means that a lower frequency leads to better carbon dioxide removal, which is exactly opposite to a conventional ventilation. In a conventional ventilation, higher frequency leads to higher removal. But in high frequency ventilation, a lower frequency leads to higher tidal ventilation, tidal volume, that leads to a better CO2 removal. That's one important point to remember. And second is, second way of actually making is, I can make the higher amplitude. It means that I can make the piston power actually stronger. So what will happen now? My actually sinus wave is going to be actually even more taller. So that's going to give me actually more tidal volume. So I'm going to get an extra advantage, more tidal volume actually here. So now by increasing the amplitude, it means I'm making my piston more powerful or by bringing down the frequency, that is a low frequency, so I can modify the oscillating volume or a tidal volume, which is going to help actually in better CO2 removal. That's a very important point to understand. So that's how we try to couple the amplitude and frequency with the carbon dioxide removal. Now this one actually is the airway pressure. The whole area under the curve, that's a mean airway pressure or the pressure AW is called airway and you can find line itself, it's mean or, or a, an average. So eventually if I'm going to modify the amplitude, to some extent I'm going to modify the mean airway pressure also. But they are largely uncoupled. That is an important point to understand here. Now how HFE works physiologically? So we all know about this the very famous pressure volume loop or a PV loop. So the X axis gives the pressure in centimeters of water. The Y axis shows actually the volume change for a given change in pressure. So this one is a typical actually PV loop. And this one actually is called the lower inflection point, the very important point. What does it mean exactly? At some point, as the pressure keeps on increasing, at some point, the change in volume for a given change in pressure becomes very dramatically higher. So the loop actually goes up very significantly. And that's a point actually where the lung is opened up. The collapse alveol is opened up. That's a lower inflection point. So normally to have an optimal lung ventilation in a conventional ventilation, you tend to operate at somewhere here. That's the point where you operate. So this is a point where actually you operate. But in high frequency ventilation, it's entirely different. Here you keep on distending the lung. The distending pressure actually is higher. So you go till the point of maximum distension. And then you bring down the distension pressure now to a point actually of lesser distension than the maximum. And then you hold on there. And then you actually oscillate here. It means that you are actually operating somewhere here. So that's the point. You, you operate in the expiratory limb, not in the inspiratory limb. And here, the oscillations keep happening up and down. So the conceptually, HFE is entirely different in comparison to conventional ventilation. So and this has a major advantage. Since actually I'm holding the whole breath actually, I'm oscillating here, it fits into the so-called open lung concept, which came from adults to the neonates, to the children to the neonates. So in a normal ventilation conventionally, you operate here, but in HFE, you operate in the expiratory limb. So you hold on here and then you oscillate. So the second important term actually I would like to is actually open lung concept. That's very important. That's how the HFE physiologically differs from the conventional ventilation. Now the question actually is that if you very small oscillating volume, how does it really help for the gas exchange? This one is a very famous diagram. Almost all of us are laid actually as a part in the last 10, 15 years. Very famous diagram. Now it's a colored one, which describes you about actually all the common theoretical again mechanisms, how an HFE works. There are multiple mechanisms of this, starting from actually turbulence to direct ventilation to an asymmetric velocity profile, fender lift effect, communication between two alveoli, Taylor dispersion, laminar flow, radial mixing, collateral ventilation, turbulent flow, radial mixing. So multiple mechanisms have been proposed, many are theoretical, again HFE. But I'm going to tell about only two important mechanisms. One is called as asymmetric velocity profile. So it means that the velocity profile is not symmetric, it's asymmetric. So which means that the profile is different during inspiration and different during expiration. 
So that is important actually to allow the gas molecules to move further into the airway inside. This is very important to understand. What exactly it means? You can see here, this one is a hollow tube. So this tube actually has got gas molecules lined up actually here. During inspiration, the gas molecules now move towards in this direction. But you can find that actually the molecules that are actually close to the periphery, they move less or they don't move. At the same time, molecules in the center, they actually move farther away. So it's more like a two-step forward. So movement happens less in the periphery, movement happens more towards the center. What will happen during expiration? So the expiration, the same gas molecules are now pulled back because active expiration in oscillatory ventilation, they're pulled back. And the molecules actually move only one step backward. They don't move actually two steps, so it's one step backward. So eventually you gain an advantage of this much. So you started actually here at the beginning of the inspiration, at the end of expiration you are here. So eventually the gas molecules actually have moved from this location to this location. So as the oscillations keep happening repeatedly, the gas molecules will actually will, can, will start moving actually from this point. So eventually you can find at this point. That's how the gas molecules travel down the airway. So that's very important concept to understand asymmetric velocity profile. That's how a smaller volume, even the very small volume, but eventually with the repeated oscillations, they tend to actually move farther in the airway. Now, second important is its concept is pendle F effect. So this one actually is not very peculiar for high frequency. It works even in conventional ventilation also, but it works actually very well in high frequency because what happens in higher frequencies, more than eight, nine Hertz frequencies, the gas distribution, it becomes dependent on the time constant inequalities. Presume that you are an airway here and there are two alveoli here. And one alveoli has a different time constant because actually it's not as distant as other alveoli. So eventually the alveoli which has a short time constant will fill faster and will empty faster. And when it empties, it will not empty back into the airway. It will actually empty into the other alveoli. So this leads to something called as collateral ventilation. So collateral happening at this level and happening at this level also. You have actually pores of corn in the physiology of all this thing. The pores of corn helps for ventilation between the alveoli, but the pendle effect actually helps to ventilate between the alveoli also. And that works better in higher frequency. That's the reason it works better in high frequency ventilation. And third important concept is called molecular diffusion. So a molecular diffusion is there even in normal ventilation also. But this mechanism actually works far, far better in high frequency ventilation. So asymmetric velocity profile, which allows the, allows the gas to move forward. A pendle lift helps in inter-alveolar communication. And a molecular diffusion works actually far better in, the, in high frequency ventilation. And now, this one is a very important slide. So if you look at the categories of high frequency ventilation, there are four basic categories are there. The first one is high frequency oscillatory ventilation. We talk more about HFO today. The second is jet ventilation and third is high frequency flow interrupters and fourth is high frequency positive pressure ventilation. So HF PPV actually is more like a, a, a normal conventional ventilation where it tend to use higher rates. It's not truly high frequency ventilation. So mechanism is if you see the oscillator, you have a device. The device could be a piston or a diaphragm or a combination of piston and diaphragm that moves the gas back and forth at the airway opening at the proximal airway opening at a higher frequency and a very small tidal volume. Expiration is active, as I told you. And there is a O2, CO2 uncoupling actually happens very significantly in this case, complete uncoupling. And a typical example actually is a sensor medics ventilator. You call as a, a classical example where actually high frequency has been described. And the mechanism in sensor medics actually is a piston diaphragm combination. A piston moves the diaphragm back and forth. In a jet ventilator, the jet is being injected. The gas gets into the, into the main airway through another airway. So that's how it gets inside. Again, it's high frequency. But the tidal volumes are not very small as in HFO. They are actually equal to or more than dead space ventilation. Expiration is passive. It means that it depends on the, the patient, the newborn's elastic recoil. That's very important. And the O2 CO2 uncoupling actually is partial in this, not complete. It means that to modify some parameter which modifies O2, 
the CO2 also gets modified to some extent. Uh, typical example actually is a banal life pulse. So it's not actually being being used in anywhere in the India as far as I know. And the mechanism is a jet pulse. That's the main mechanism. Now, I skipped one important thing. So you look at this frequency and tidal volume relation. I told you in one earlier slide, lower the frequency, higher the oscillating volume or tidal volume. So there is an inverse relationship actually in the case of high frequency oscillatory ventilation. But in the rest all, the relation is either constant or they are standard. Which means that in oscillatory ventilation, lower frequency leads to higher tidal volume, higher oscillatory volume and better CO2 removal. This is a very important point to understand. Uh, coming to the common ventilators, there are many ventilators. This, this one actually is a sensor medics, which I was talking about. The 3100A, A is for newborns and young infants, B is for children as well as in adult patients. So another one actually you can find here, the Fabian HFO is more actually into the into the, into the the vogue. And at this point, actually sensor medics and the Fabian are owned by the same brand. They actually bought each other, so they are owned by the same company. The Dragger actually has a Dragger Baby Lock Plus and the more recent is the Dragger VN500, both have high frequency function in them. And one more European actually brand is the Leone Plus, but not actually much found in India and you can find many more models. So the common HFO ventilators, I try to summarize the common HFO ventilators available and how do they differ from each other. So the sensor medics actually has a piston diaphragm combination as I told you. So the Stephen, that is Stephen uh, is a brand, is a manufacturer. The manufacturer, Sophie is a newborn ventilator, which again has a piston diaphragm combination. The Fabian HFO has a single diaphragm, doesn't a piston, the single diaphragm sheet that keeps oscillating front and back. And the Leone Plus again has a diaphragm, but double diaphragm. The common one, which many of us use, the Dragger Baby Lock Plus, it doesn't have diaphragm, doesn't have piston. So many call actually this one as a hybrid high frequency ventilator. So this one have solenoid valves and the expiratory limb has got a venturi mechanism. Venturi mechanism where actually you create a negative you know, exhaust like mechanism. It tries to actually suck out the gas during expiration. So it actually a pseudo active expiration not true active expiration. That is the reason it falls under the hybrid modes of high frequency ventilation. So it has a valve plus venturi mechanism. Uh, the Dragger VN Pioneer actually has same valve and venturi mechanism, but probably a stronger valve and a stronger venturi mechanism. The SLE 5000, 6000 actually has a, it, they call as a valveless jet mechanism, where they tend to have a rotating ball valve. So it tries to actually jet the gas inside and then suck out the gas outside. So they claim actually an active expiration again, but pseudo active expiration again in this case. That's a principle. But the important part actually is to look at the IE ratio. So that's an inspiration expiration ratio. So it is important again because the time given for inspiration decides oxygenation. But in HFO, the time for inspiration decides the ventilation also. But typically in a sensor medics, you tend to use actually 1 is to 2 ratio. That's the ratio typically used, which will give 33% time actually for inspiration and the rest for the expiration. That is important. And this is important actually in higher frequencies. If you use higher frequencies like 9, 10 and beyond 10 hertz, you should always use 1 is to 2 ratio, not a 1 is to 1 ratio. So because higher frequency, you have lesser expiration already. So 1 is to 1 ratio, you have 50% time for expiration. But in lower frequencies, you have higher time for expiration. So higher frequencies, you always should choose 1 is to 2 ratio. Tend to give actually higher time for expiration also. Otherwise, you can lead to air trapping and CO2 buildup. That is important. So frequency range almost same for all the ventilators. The amplitude or the piston power, another important factor that controls CO2 removal. So generally given as centimeters of water in all the ventilators, but the Stephen Sophie gives in percentage and it limits a maximum 20 ml. It means that you cannot actually, you cannot move the back gas in and out more than 20 ml. That's a limiting factor again. It means that beyond 10 kilo, the Stephen Sophie would not work really effectively because it has a maximum limit of 20 ml. But again, a normal newborn would not be till 10 kilo, so it's fine for a new ventilation. The Dragger Baby Lock Plus has a problem. It again gives in percentage. 
and this percentage is a little different calculating. The percentage actually is a percentage of peak output of the, of the airway pressure. So the formula is you take a number of 16 and look at the map. I said 15, for example, map. 60 minus 15 is 45 centimeters of water. So I set the percentage of the difference. Like say I make it 30%, it is 30% of 45 centimeters of water, which will be around 12 to 14 centimeters of water. That's how driver calculates. This one has a problem. The problem actually is that there is a lower map, maps of six, seven centimeters of water. Your, your actually oscillation, the power of oscillation gets really affected. It means that uh, the piston power or the amplitude would not be enough to remove the CO2. That means that you cannot go the, go on map below a limit, so which makes it actually the amplitude is dependent on map also. So that's a drawback in Dragger Baby Lock Plus. But Dragger VN500 and the rest all doesn't have the drawback. Uh, this is another important function. It's called as bias flow. So bias flow is another parameter you can use to control the CO2. I'll tell you later what exactly it means. So only two ventilators have the bias flow where you can modify them independently. One is Sensormatics and second is Fabian. And the rest all the flow actually is pretty much automated. You cannot modify them. You don't have a separate knob for modifying the bias flow. That is an important part to understand. And Sensormatics actually is a pure HFO ventilator. You cannot combine with conventional ventilation. It doesn't have side breath. You cannot know the, you don't have graphics to understand what happens in Sensormatics. And you don't actually have a, Tidal volume measurement doesn't happen. And the recent ventilators like Fabian and all, they have a mode called a volume guarantee in HFO. You can combine volume guarantee in HFO also. So those things are not there in Sensormatics. Sensormatics actually is a pure, pure HFO ventilator. So no tidal volume measurement, no graphics, no combine, com no combination of VGS, but very powerful ventilator. Like say if you have an edematous newborn, a large newborn, a diabetic newborn, being for 4.5 kg has permanent hypertension and I want actually really push him hard, then Sensormatics is the ideal choice. So Fabian probably matches the Sensormatics because of I think same mechanism. Rest all actually have a little lesser power compared to Sensormatics. Uh, the Sensormatics looks like this. So you can see actually here this 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 actually the picture that shows Sensormatics how that it works. You have an endotracheal tube at one end. So so you can find FGF is a fresh gas flow or the bias flow and you have actually a low pass filter here. So it means that the gas moves in this direction and the exhaust actually is here in this direction. So you can find actually a piston that rotates actually here and diaphragm here. So this one actually is a piston that rotates and you can find a diaphragm, a black color thing diaphragm. The piston as it rotates the diaphragm is moved in and out like this. So this is a portion where the diaphragm is located in a sensormatics. You can find a black structure there, which actually is moving in and out. That's how it works. So it has a window for mean airway pressure and it has actually a window to look at the amplitude and the knob is called as a power button, which again, nothing but amplitude modification. And then you can set the TI, you can set the bias flow you can separate knob where you can modify the bias flow in sensormatics. So, and you have the diaphragm at this location and this one is a special uh, circuit with all the dump valve inside. So very complex um, equipment, but it is actually the classical equipment for high frequency ventilation in a neonate and children to be more effective. So this one actually is how uh, a goat lung, uh, uh, what will happen if you ventilate in a sensormatics? I guess the video plays. So this one actually has got a low normal map and the map is going to go up now. You can see how it inflates. We we'll just see how the, as the map goes up, you can find the whole thing goes up now. Now the map has been increased, higher map, higher map. So you can find the lung, you know, better inflation in this with higher map and higher optimizing the lung volume. And uh, this one actually has a pneumothorax in this lung. You can find actually a perforation at this point. So that's how uh, lung, when the map goes up, you can see how the, in the real lung, how that inflates and how it becomes better. The same on non-sensometics in action. 
So it's a very noisy ventilator. You know, it makes a lot of noise in the liquid inside. This one is a map, PAW in centimeters of water. So various controls. And uh, this one actually can find, uh, I'm sorry, this one tells about the piston position. I'll play it again. Just a second. So you can find the piston position actually here. Piston moving in directions, you can find it here. So this one is amplitude, set in centimeters of water. 33% is inspirated time actually shown here. There's a bias flow knob and uh, this is the diaphragm portion I told you. There is a circuit going actually here under the diaphragm and uh, a very thick and low compliance circuit because compliance circuit becomes very important. If it is a very high compliance circuit, then the pressure would lost, get dampened and circuit itself doesn't reach the um, airway as well as alveoli. So need to have a very stiff special design circuit to give high frequency ventilators. Okay. Now let's come to the key control parameters. So the key control parameters actually are these. The first one actually is a mean airway pressure or PAW in centimeters of water I showed you already. The second is amplitude in centimeters of water or in percent in some ventilators. And third is a frequency in Hertz. Uh, fourth is I time percentage and the last is FIO in percentage. So so the FAO actually is largely not the ventilator dependent, so that, that's a separate function. So primarily is going to be actually a mean airway pressure, amplitude, and the frequency you're going to play around. Uh, the oxygenation depends on two important parameters, the MAP and FAO2. The MAP is an important parameter, and the MAP has actually a separate knob. So you're going to modify the MAP up and down to optimize the lung volume and optimize oxygenation. The ventilation depends on the stroke volume. Stroke volume again depends on the amplitude. Or the piston power on the frequency so and ventilation and oxygenation they are largely independent the general initial settings are you choose a map of roughly one to two centimeters of water higher than the map in the conventional ventilation which means that if you actually are ventilating in a normal ventilation conventional ventilation and the newborn fails conventional ventilation i want to move to high frequency ventilation as a rescue therapy so we choose normally one to two centimeters of water actually higher than the map in the conventional ventilation. And, but if primary mode, not a rescue mode, the first time I'm putting on hydrogen directly as a primary mode. So as a rule of thumb, you choose a map which is roughly half to one third of the amplitude. So generally say uh, another way is to look at the, uh, like say intubate, you do a bag and tube ventilation. And if it is a mild to moderately stiff lung, where you presume that the PAP would be somewhere at 14 to 18 centimeters of water, then you can choose half the PAP, which becomes 7 to 9 in this case. So the various ways of deciding. So all the rules of thumb again. The first would be that you choose half to one to the amplitude, or if I use a bag and tube ventilation, I know the PAP as a guess estimate, and I use half of the PAP, that is 7 to 9 centimeters of water. So how to understand amplitude? Because I should know the power first to understand the map. So, so this one, the simplest way, the clinical way is to look at the wiggling of the abdomen. The wiggling or the oscillating, oscillating abdomen should happen till the abdomen portion and not below the abdomen. And how does it look? So this one actually is a newborn's video. You can see the oscillations here. So chest is oscillating, abdomen is oscillating. But the oscillation should not go till the thigh or below thigh level. If the oscillation happens at thigh level, it means that you are actually over oscillating. It means that the higher power of the piston, you have to bring down the amplitude. So look at the amplitude first and decide amplitude and roughly choose half to one third as a mean area pressure. That's a way to start the ventilation in HFO. So as I told you, uh, one could be that you can actually use the uh, wiggling or you can use as a rule of thumb, double the map. It means that map is half the amplitude or amplitude is double the map. That's a relation. So, and if I use actually a amplitude, which is more than three times of map, it can lead to air trapping. It means that higher the amplitude can lead to air trapping also. If it is very high, more than thrice the map, then that can lead to air trapping also. That is important. 
now the choosing the frequency so there is something called a lung resonating frequency it means that every every lung has every object in the world actually has a resonating frequency it means that they are not static they all resonate you may not see it but they all resonate so similarly a, a human lung also has a resonating frequency it is resonating all the time it means it is moving back and forth vibrating all the time so our frequency should match the a native lungs resonating frequency that is very important and the frequency matching means that in a premature newborn generally you choose a higher frequency 10 11 12 hertz so then you match the resonating frequency in a term newborn you go for a lower frequency 6 7 8 9 hertz that's a lower frequency range so in that case in doing so you tend to match the lungs resonating frequency that's one way of doing it another way actually is to match the frequency with the co2 removal but we generally strongly recommend not to modify the frequency very frequently that means that you fix a frequency depending on the gestation a premature newborn higher frequency 10 to 15 hertz a term newborn a lower frequency 7 to 9 hertz and usually you hold on the frequency there without making much rapid modification because as i told you any modification of frequency is going to dramatically modify the time available actually for the inspiration or tidal volume or oscillating volume that's going to actually modify the co2 very significantly so generally you fix a frequency depending on gestation and the carbon dioxide removal is modified using the amplitude not frequency much the fourth component is time for inspiration i told you 1 is to 2 is the normal ratio chosen higher the high time leads to higher the elimination rarely we use 1 is to 1 ratio but in neonates the common is 1 is to 2 ratio that is 33% of the inspiration and 67% of expiration that's a common combination so that's important an important precaution is don't combine a higher frequency of more than 10 hertz and a 1 is to 1 ratio higher frequency always should combine with 1 is to 2 ratio that's very important a higher frequency and 1 is to 1 ratio would lead to a shorter expiration time expiration time that can lead to air trapping also that's very important another way to modify the co2 is bias gas flow but you don't normally modify it because the bias gas flow you can find the bias gas flow in sensor medics is a last resort for co2 elimination higher the bias gas flow higher co2 elimination but generally frequency and the bias flow are the last to be handled to modify the amplitude to modify co2 removal okay now to nutshell so if you want to look at the hfo strategies there are two ways of doing it actually conditions where you need a higher mean pressure typical example is a premature newborn with rds with hrf hypoxemic respiratory failure so you choose actually you want an open lung concept to operate here you want a higher mean airway pressure in those conditions we choose a higher map which is 2 to 3 centimeters of water more than the conventional ventilation and we fix up the amplitude as discussed earlier the frequency is higher because you are handling a premature newborn you can go up till 15 hertz also in extreme preterm newborn and since higher frequency we choose actually 1 is to 2 ratio as a high time and for titration of map we should look at the pao2 and saturations and then modify the fao2 appropriately and you can do an x ray to look at the inflation also i'll talk about this little later what exactly means how to do that and for modifying the amplitude you should look at the pseo2 or you should look at the transcutaneous co2 also where you can get actually a continuous monitoring because any small change in amplitude is going to actually lead to a very significant change in the pseo2 so which means that you need to have frequent blood gases and frequent blood loss to prevent this many centers use tcco2 where actually non invasive you can put a probe sensor and you're going to get a continuous co2 measurement so any modification amplitude is going to tell us it is out immediately the frequency and high time is largely untouched but in conditions where your cdp distending pressure is not really important objective like typical example is a term newborn in the cone aspiration syndrome i don't want a higher pressure because the risk of air leak is there so recruitment is there but lung is largely heterogeneous so i want a low distending pressure not a high distending pressure in such condition i choose a map little lesser than the map in 
in this case here two three centimeters higher than combination here one two centimeters higher than combination temperature rest all remain same and the term baby i'm going to choose a lower frequency not a higher frequency so i told you x-ray can be used this is an example actually of an optimal inflation in hfo and high hyperinflation it's the same newborn very fresh newborn three days back we shot the x-ray and leave aside the remaining problems and all in that the line is not in place so this one actually is a optimal inflation you start counting from this arrow location so it'll be one two three four five six seven eight and eight and a half which means that in the hfo you want the inflation to be a little higher side not like conventional ventilation where seven to eight centimeter eight uh, space you want here you want eight to nine spaces but anything beyond nine becomes hyperinflation the same newborn at a higher map as a compliance starts improving so the same newborn this one becomes a hyperinflation here 9.5 10 space actually has hyperinflation so that's one way but the important part is you need to have a well centered x-ray and if there's rotation is their component you cannot really comment about the inflation so any other way to optimize the lung volume that is the way to optimize lung volume how to optimize it so you should understand this so this graph shows various points you can find point a b c d and e point a is when the lung is completely collapsed point b is the lung when completely distended and point c lung is partly collapsed and point d again back to complete distension and e is a point between maximum distension and partly collapsed so we want to operate at point e to know the point e one mechanism proposed actually is when you start the ventilation you set a map which gives actually a saturation in this range and choose an fio2 arbitrary so we can choose 40 50 percent and a map depending on the amplitude or depending on the conventional ventilation settings and increase the map by one to two centimeters of water every two three minutes until saturation improves to target range like say my preterm you want the rds and my target is 95 to 97 percent or 93 to 95 percent i set the target range depending actually on the risk involved with you know the toxicity of oxygen so and saturation at some point the beginning could be lower so keep on increasing the map every two three minutes until saturation improves and it enters the target range saturation so which means that you actually have opened up the lung now you are the opening pressure increase further the map by one two centimeters of water higher so that is the point actually when you reach some maximum descending pressure saturation starts falling down it means that it doesn't any more help so now bring down the map at this point by same one two centimeters of water saturation when it falls then again go up by higher pressure it means that you're operating somewhere in this curve so i opened up actually here so i opened up somewhere in between this opening pressure i reached a maximum pressure actually here now i bring down the map further so i got actually a closing pressure saturation has fallen down again further i increase further i get a better saturation then i decrease one centimeter and operate there it means that you actually have to have a live example to decide the optimal lung volume and optimal map that's one way we can do on the bedside a simpler way actually is to look at the x-ray because x-ray look at saturations and look at the lowest fio2 to achieve saturation and that's the right map you want to choose that's how you can optimize in a research setting you have various ways you can use a platinum graph you can use an impedance uh, you know measurement to look at the optimal optimal lung volume but in a real clinical example it's all difficult to use it so the determinants of optimal lung volume are many uh, the i time determines but two important determinants is very important iso frequency but always understand that the endotracheal tube is another important actually variable which modifies the optimal lung volume so so try to use actually a largest possible diameter actually in a tube in a given patient because smaller the diameter so there is going to be more dampening so optimizing lung volume or removing co2 all become difficult so try to use the largest possible possible and diameter of an endotracheal tube to actually prevent these complications so now let, let, once done with this let troubleshooting measures 
what I should do in a problem, a given problem. A problem one could be that you have an inadequate oxygenation. First one. It means that you have atelectasis, still the lung is not recruited. So you can have an X-ray that shows poor lung inflation also. So it means the lung is not open. You can increase the airway pressure by one, two centimeters of water. Or you can consider actually giving some side breaths. Some machines have giving a side breaths. You can give manual breath. So, and you can decide the time also, how long you want to give. So, some authors recommend actually giving a sustained inflation or side breaths for some time, 10 to 15 seconds. But many authors recommend in such cases, so when there is an uh, inadequate airway pressure or a map, so they say that you go up on the map, not side breath, go up on the map itself, hold on higher map for a few hours, maybe three to four hours. So, optimize the lung volume and then bring back the airway pressure to the original pressure. Because high frequency, what happens is, because some leaks happening here and there, many times, over the time, the lung volume, you tend to lose it. So that's one of the common reasons actually why that you say, okay, I found a newborn at maps of 10, 12 centimeters of water, and we actually had a normal saturation. And suddenly, actually, the saturation is going down. What is the reason? It's a very common phenomenon in HF4 that you tend to lose the lung volume. When you lose the lung volume after the next few hours, one way is to give a side breath or a sustained inflation for some time or a better way, a less traumatic way could be actually to increase the map itself by one to two centimeters of water, hold on there for some four to six hours, ensure that the saturations are now better at a lower FiO2 and then bring back actually the pressure to the original pressure level. That's one way actually of optimizing the lung volume. So, and if you have inadequate oxygenation, a second scenario, but the lung is hyper expanded with or without hypercapnia. So, which means actually you are operating at the higher descending pressure. You have to bring down the airway pressure by the same number, and then you can repeat X ray and look at the expansion again. So, it means that you can have a poor oxygenation with an under inflated lung also or an hyper expanded lung also. Both are not good, as you know, HFO. Third could be you can sometimes have an hypercapnia with a normal lung volumes on X ray. So, in those conditions, one would actually try to modify the amplitude first. You don't generally modify the frequency, even though I said actually here as an option. But you need to increase the piston power, increase the amplitude first. And if there is hypocarbia, then decrease the amplitude. And if there is hyperoxia, then modify the FAO2 first. And if required, then you can bring down the airway pressure. Uh, another common problem actually is loose, losing your chest wiggling. So some suddenly you can find it's not wiggling anymore. So it could be a tube block, partial complete block could be there. Uh, it could be a rigid lung. Sometimes you use fentanyl as, a, as an analgesic and it, it's known to cause chest rigidity or chest wall edema in a septic newborn. But another important complication is called necrotizing tracheobronchitis. So that's a very, very actually common complication using long-term HFO and HFJ. More jet ventilation, but occurs in oscillatory ventilation also. So, so this actually manifests early because of mucus plug. A mucus plug over a few days can lead to a block and loss of chest wiggling. That could be an early indicator of a necrotizing tracheobronchitis also. Then one have to do a suctioning or bronchoscopy, many more things you have to consider. Uh, common indications, as I told, hypoxemic respiratory failure, either a preterm or term newborn, where we use high frequency ventilation. CDH is one actually a standard indication for HFO. Many centers use HFO, primary HFO, or an elective HFO in the conditions. I don't know how much time I have, I have to rush out. Pulmonary air leak syndromes is another actually standard indication, or pulmonary artery hypertension. Those standard indications are these four hypoxemic respiratory failure, diaphragmatic hernia, pulmonary air leak syndromes. It means that you have an air leak already, you have a pneumothorax, you have PIE, and I want to prevent a new air leak or I want to prevent actually the, the air leak to further progress, I can use this. So, or pulmonary artery hypertension, the common indications in HFO. And you can use a primary mode of choice or a rescue mode, as I told. So, now a little bit about evidence for HFO. So, there are many questions commonly arise. So, HFO versus HFV versus a conventional ventilation, what is evidence? HFO versus J versus flow interrupter, what is evidence? Primary versus rescue early versus late rescue, and HFV in different disease process, disease A versus B versus C. Uh, 
what is the exit policy should be there hfo to rooma directly or to uh, back to conventional ventilation or back to cpap what should be the point of weaning when i should exit and what is the role of volume targeting and volume guarantee combination in hfo versus conventional ventilation so i have marked actually many as a cross mark so those cross mark we don't have any evidence in them you may have some animal experiments animal evidence there are no human trials which compared them so i cannot talk anything about those evidence but we do have evidence actually where hfo is compared with conventional ventilation hfj and conventional ventilation evidence is there i'll just pass through very fast so elective ventilation versus conventional ventilation so you look at the mortality there is no mortality benefit so both are having equal death rates or equal risk of death so if you look at actually chronic lung disease there is a benefit look at the chronic lung disease so you can find that using high frequency oscillatory ventilation elective there is actually a 14% reduction in the risk of chronic lung disease in comparison to a conventional ventilation so chronic lung disease is only one outcome which actually hfo is better than conventional ventilation even though the the effect is very marginal but still it there is some benefit is there similarly if you take death or cld as a composite outcome the hfo has some benefit marginal but some benefit is there a 10% reduction in the risk of death or cld as a chronic as, as a composite outcome apart from this so if you look at actually complications so there is some evidence that says that uh, the risk of pulmonary air leak risk of uh, air leak is higher in hfo in comparison to conventional ventilation even though it looks a little counterintuitive on one hand we are saying that a newborn has an air leak i'm going to put an hfo but the same hfo leads to higher risk of air leak so these all studies actually had a lot of heterogeneity so it's difficult to really extrapolate and they are quite older studies none of them are fresh studies except this last one it was in 12 but they all are fresh air leaks but in a newborn who has an existing air leak so there is evidence to say that actually any fresh air leak doesn't happen so it means that risk of air leak is higher but a newborn already has an air leak like a pneumothorax or pie you put that that newborn hfo the risk of a new air leak is lesser significantly in hfo in comparison to conventional ventilation that's how one has to understand this so risk of bleed intraventricular bleed actually is higher so two significant complication one is an air leak second is ivh but these all actually are very older studies and many actually are during the surfactant era early surfactant era so accepting those at this point actually becomes very difficult so i'll rush through rop has a benefit lesser rop with hfo than conventional ventilation so if you look at different subgroups so if you use a high volume strategy as i told you earlier try to use a higher descending pressure and high volume so in this condition it tends to work similar as a, as a low volume strategy it means that a higher descending pressure and lower pressure doesn't really vary the effects would remain as it is so now that's an elective hfo so in rescue hfo you have a very very meager evidence there's only one trial that is compared a rescue mode versus remaining conventional ventilations only one trial 1993 20 years old there's no trial to compare a rescue hfo and cme so there's no evidence to say that we should or we should have used rescue hfo but despite all this lack of evidence so many centers almost all the centers including our center they start with a conventional ventilation at at some point a newborn fails then we rescue the newborn using a rescue hfo that's a common practice so now which is best the answer is not known hfo hfj hffi hfppv so which is best answer is not known you have some uh, some animal studies there is no good human animal comparison so there is no answer for this question so compare is comparing various hfp techniques as i told you actually that uh, one thing what we know is in animals if you use hfo alone versus hfo and uh, ime combination so this combination is not really preferred because it can lead to more lung injury but that's again animals so there's no studies in human beings so again i said bpd when you use can you use hfo early that means it a rescue hfo but you rescue early then later so it's not really recent trials the trials are very old again 15 20 years old there's no trial after this 
So there's no difference in death or BPD, no difference in death alone, BPD alone, IVH, no difference in early HFE and late HFE also. Right, this passed through. Now let me take some few questions, frequently asked questions. So one question is, can I do suctioning during HFO? So that's one common question our residents keep asking. Uh, uh, answer is not, uh, routine suctioning is not actually advised during HFO. One should avoid routine suction is very, very important. What will happen is because in high frequency, recruiting the lung volume becomes very difficult. And the same way as recruiting is more difficult, but de-recruitment, losing a lung volume actually is very easy. Moment you disconnect a newborn from the ventilation while being on HFO, you lose the recruitment actually advantage you gained very rapidly. And again, the recruitment is going to take actually similarly, going to take next half an hour to one hour to recruit. So whenever you disconnect a newborn for suctioning, so you have to understand that you're going to de-recruit the lung and going to cause more troubles. So one has to use actually inline suctioning, but still inline suctioning would lead to some de-recruitment, some loss of volume. So try to keep suctioning as minimum as possible. Second question is uh, frequency of blood gas. First 24 hours of HFO, first 12 hours of HFO, you need to have frequent blood gases. So maybe actually every half an hour, every one hour to titrate the map as well as amplitude. But once you know the right pressure and right amplitude, then again, it's like any other ventilation, once in two to four hours. Another way actually is to use a transcutaneous monitoring, continuous monitoring of PO2 and PCO2. So that will actually prevent frequent sampling and frequent blood sampling and blood loss also. So should the newborn be paralyzed? Answer is no. Routine paralysis is not indicated. Typical example is a term newborn, Mekonum aspiration syndrome. You can find them tachypnic, breathing at 100, 120 rates. So we all are concerned actually that are we giving really HFO or not? So you should not paralyze unless there is a real, real, real indication that you're not able to maintain oxygenation and ventilation. Otherwise, routine paralysis is not indicated. You may use a low dose sedation analgesic like fentanyl. So, but paralysis is not indicated. Would auscultation help? Because high frequency, I cannot hear anything. Auscultation would not help. Understanding the air entry is virtually next to impossible while auscultation. That's the reason you should look at the need for FiO2, look at saturations, look at the X-ray, look at the map, look at chest rise, and then you decide. Auscultation would not help. Should I combine IME breaths? If possible, do not combine because the risk of lung damage is higher. Even though we don't have human studies, only animal trials, animal studies, but still, if possible, do not compare, do not combine. But you may end up losing the lung volume over some time. At the time, you may end up giving certain side breaths. In those conditions, you can use a higher map for a few hours and come back to the previous map. Uh, it's a better, better way of handling than combining IME breaths. Chest movement alone would help to understand the amplitude. That's the best clinical bedside way to understand. To look at the wiggling, you can look at CO2, but the early change, early response, titration of amplitude, actually you can use this movement alone. The last question many, many people ask, can I combine VG? VG is more actually available there in all the recent uh, equipment. You don't have any trials to compare that, how the volume guarantee, which guarantees the oscillatory volume by actually modifying the amplitude on the map, the answer is not known. So take home slide, despite lack of robust evidence, HFE is an important and an effective mode of ventilation in neonates that we had to understand. So a typical example is a preterm RDS baby uh, who has hypoxemia. So in those conditions, we always prefer a high volume strategy, try to optimize the volume, recruit the maximum lung possible, and then keep oscillating in that volume. So optimizing the lung volume, you can use saturations, you can use FiO2 and then modify the airway pressure appropriately. Chest X-ray, if you can do well and good, that helps to understand the inflation. But again, in many centers, X-ray takes time and X-ray can lead to destabilization of newborn also. So a clinical examination can go wrong. So X-ray is ideal, but you can optimize using saturation FiO2 also. Uh, amplitude is a key for CO2 removal. Frequency, bias flow, modifying the IT ratio, all should be kept to the minimum. Modify only the amplitude to, to remove the CO2. 
understand that any small change in the airway pressure and every small change in amplitude they are going to lead to large fluctuations in the inflation oxygenation as well as the co2 they are not like conventional ventilation a small change will lead to very large fluctuation so make very very small change and wait for the response to happen that is very important take home slide 2 is very important so understand the relation between the frequency lung compliance et size and i time as i told you so try to use actually the et as large as possible causing less injury also do not break the circuit unless it's necessary so keep suctioning very minimum and over time the pressure loss may happen so as i told you you can increase the airway pressure gradually and decrease later avoid paralysis use analgesic sedatives judiciously i'll stop here i took close to one hour yeah thank you uh, venkat i think we absolutely didn't mind you taking a little longer time because i think there were a lot of take home and a lot of practical tips i'm sure each one of us have learned a lot today uh quickly uh, can i just uh, ask some questions that have been posed by the participants uh, venkat the first question somebody asked uh, dr anil kail kalesh